Scott, shall I yeah. uh, screen share? Uh, do you want to allow me to screen share? Okay, you should be able to screen share now. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Good stuff. Okay. Uh, oh dear. Cool. Are we good? Yes. Right. I'm going to minimise my face. Uh, so, hi guys. Thanks for coming to General Club. So, I'm going to talk about this article by Saren Briggs, which appeared in MSJ last week. So, the background to this, which uh, you guys know, is that cigarette smoking is very bad for MS. And by that, I mean smoking increases your risk of developing MS with an odds ratio of about 1.5. Uh, and if you have MS, it's probably associated with higher conversion from relapsing to progressive, higher conversion from, um, from CIS to clinically definite, definite MS, more relapses if you have relapsing MS, and interestingly, also associated with more neutralizing antibodies, for example, to natalizumab or to interferon. So it's quite unclear how the cigarette smoking actually does this. It's probably not um, tobacco itself. It's probably not the nicotine itself. It's probably something to do with um, smoking that. So with uh, all of the toxins that come from um, you know, the tar and the things that are put in cigarettes and from actually lighting the cigarettes up themselves. Because all tobacco itself is probably protected. So snus, as you guys both know, and people listening probably know, snus, which is all tobacco, which is used in, uh, widely in Scandinavia, is probably protective. And the Scandinavian epidemiological groups delighted in this finding because Thomas Olsen is a famous advocate of snus. That's quite an interesting finding that suggests that maybe nicotine, maybe tobacco are protective, and it's probably something else to do with inhalation or to do with the, the act of smoking, of lighting up itself, uh, which is pro-inflammatory. Uh, I do think we need to emphasize here for people watching this that, that mm. this doesn't mean that snuff is healthy. Uh, no. You know, just... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, this is a, this is a very narrow perspective. It's, uh, a narrow perspective <laughs> on the <a> mass risk. <laughs> so, just, so, so just to give you the, the background politics, uh, I think Sweden's the only country where snuff is, is legal. Yeah. Um, and it was actually legalized there before the European Union uh, was formed in a sense. Okay. And, well, yeah, under, under under EU rules, no other countries had snuff legalized. Okay. Well, now that we're a sovereign nation state and we can do whatever we want, maybe uh, snus will come back. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so the theory is that maybe smoking creates a kind of nidus of inflammation in the lungs, and that leads to generation of self epitopes. The so smoking does a variety of things. It's pro-inflammatory generally, so it probably upregulates the uh, MHC class one molecules. And it's possible also that there are epitopes from the various chemicals that are actually in cigarette smoke, which when presented by a particular MHC2 um, alleles uh, look like myelin peptides. And so there's this famous interaction between GRB115 and smoking, which suggests that part of the mechanism uh, might be to do with um, epitope specificity. That's a nice picture from the Olsen paper. So a bit more background. We know that genetic variation explains up to about 40% of MS heritability, did, which leads... Did you yeah. also notice that they mentioned this wrong in the introduction? Uh, uh, mentioned what, what wrong? Because they mentioned the first sentence is genetic variance additively explain 22.4% of heritability for MS. Yes, yeah, yeah, I had to check that. I, I was surprised by that as well. It's, it's 40% from the... Yes, IMS indeed. So, yeah, so a large chunk is unexplained. And a very interesting question in MS and in complex trait genetics more generally is where this missing heritability comes from. And some of it might be explained by gene environment interactions. And by that, I mean that it's conceivable there are genetic variants which are only a risk factor, factor by virtue of how they modify your response to some environmental risk. So you can envisage a situation where there might be genetic variants that changes how you metabolize cigarette smoke and that variant could be a risk factor for MS or any other smoking related disease only if that person smokes. So if you don't take into account environmental information, you miss that from pure GWAS studies because the idea is that in GWAS, environmental exposures either aren't recorded and they're probably averaged between participants. So if that's half smokers, half not, you'll dilute that signal. So gene by environment interactions might explain a lot of missing heritability in various complex traits. We know that the strongest genetic risk factor, DRB115, potentiates the effects of cigarette smoke. And there's some evidence beyond the HLA region, actually, by this same author, by um, Van Briggs, showing that possibly variation at the uh, N-acetyltransferase uh, 1 locus, so these are acetyltransferase that 
um, I, I can't remember the metabolism, but essentially they um, they modify how uh, they're involved in regulating how you acetylate um, various kind of aromatic amines. So that they've been strongly associated with the effect of uh, smoking on bladder cancer. There's some evidence that maybe variants in that one modify how cigarette smoking impacts on MS risk. And this is a nice picture from the Headstrom paper. So this is famous. Scandinavian cohort data from a long time ago now, just showing that the effect of smoking on your MS risk is vastly potentiated if you have a high risk HLA haplotype. So if you have the OB1-15 and you lack AO2. So a bit more background from EAE, it actually looks like nicotine is protective, and that's very interesting. So this black line here was just the wild type animals who were inoculated and get EAE. So the, the higher on the y-axis, the worse their disease. And what's interesting is that the red line here is if you give them nicotine, they're a bit better. And interestingly, if you knock out these nicotinic receptors, you pretty much mimic the effect of giving them nicotine. So this, and I haven't shown you all the data, but there's quite a lot of EAE data, um, which essentially suggests that nicotine is you know, protective in EAE. And this is mediated by two things. It's mediated by being an agonist at the alpha-7 nicotinic receptor and being an antagonist at the alpha-9 nicotinic receptor. So broadly, this is the kind of level I have to understand things that alpha-7 is good, alpha-9 is bad. And alpha-9 uh, knockouts essentially mimic the effect of nicotine. So if you knock out alpha-9, um, you essentially get the same effect as uh, nicotine. If you give that animal nicotine, they don't get any better. So putting that in kind of simple picture terms, both snus and uh, cigarettes have a bit of nicotine in them. And maybe nicotine decreases MS risk via agonism at the alpha-7 and antagonism at alpha-9. Importantly, cigarette smoking is very, very bad for MS. And this may be, may be mediated via nicotine, but probably actually via all of the other chemicals in nicotine, in the cigarette smoke. And we don't know how those influence MS risk. So the hypothesis here is that if nicotine is protective in human MS, there may be variation at these two genes may modify the effects of smoking on MS risk. So uh, what did uh, Dr. Briggs do? So that's the core question. So they found non-Hispanic white participants from this very interesting project, the Accelerated Cure Project, which I hadn't heard about, and I've now emailed. It looks like a really cool resource. And since the onset was after, I think it was actually after 18, I think that was a typo. And it was criteria to find MS, so these are robust definitions. It was questionnaire data to determine whether people were smokers. And stage one was a case control design with 200 cases and 176 controls. And stage two was a case only design, which we can talk about later, uh, people have questions about what they actually did there. But that was with a larger number of cases. But importantly, as far as I could tell from the paper, the, these aren't independent cohorts. These are all patients from the same cohort that they've just divided up. So that's an important distinction to make. The genotypes of the two stages on uh, different arrays, and I, I think actually the second group had maybe already been genotyped for a separate project, mm. possibly to, for the... Um, the exome chip stuff that was uh, published in Cell, the INSTC, but I, I'm not sure actually. But it, they said they were genotyped for another cohort. And the phenotype definitions were as follows. So it was ever or never smoking, and then ever smoking was uh, defined as regular use of combustible tobacco products uh, over at least a month, ever. And the timing of smoking cessation was taken into account. So if they'd given up um, smoking, if they hadn't smoked within five years of diagnosis, I think they were chucked out. But didn't you, wasn't the definition was different for the two, the two cohorts, no? Because in yeah. the first, the stage one, they only, it was, you had to have smoked one month yeah. in your life, but you know. <laughs> and then, uh, and in the second cohort, it was, um, you should have smoked in the preceding five years. So yeah. it's also one month in your lifetime. Can that be relevant? So, so I, I agree with you. I think that is an important discrepancy. I mean, what I would yeah. say is that we, we know that like the bulk of the risk is explained by a binary thing of whether you're a regular smoker or not. Yeah. And that most people who smoke for a month smoke for quite a few years. Yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. You know, in, in terms of the smoking phenotype, some people have a cigarette you know, every year or so, but the people who smoke for a chunk of time tend to smoke for a long chunk of time. But don't you think years. that that's... Time, time intervals like six months would be much more sensitive, you know? Why do you use one month? I don't see the point. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, you have to draw an arbitrary line somewhere, but yeah. I, I yeah, but agree. one month is relatively low, no? Yeah, no, no I, I think you're right. So in terms of the kind of the study design and, and the flow through the study, so they made the gene by environment interaction models and the models were of this form. So these are logistic regression models and essentially you're modeling MF status on an additive genetic model for the SNP, so you know the number of risk alleles, mm -hmm. sex, and the first five uh, NDS components, uh, and then yeah. they include smoking and a SNP by smoking interaction term. But and I, interestingly, I want to, 
Mm. Oh, yeah. I wanted to ask you this MDS component, because I, what I understand from their inclusion criteria, the population is relatively uh, homo homogeneous or homogeneous, so it's all only non-Hispanic white, so I don't understand why they need to correct for this population bias. Uh, so yeah, it's a good point. You, you do still need control, so interestingly, if you, I mean, if you, if you look at the PCs or, or MDS for uh, even a, a homogenous group in terms of self self reported ethnicity, there's still loads of variations. I mean, I, I can show you PC plots of like UK Biobank, and even within the people who identify as white British, there, there's a lot of genetic diversity. And especially for a study like this, <laughs> where relatively small numbers, <laughs> even a bit of population stratification could obviously create... the Brit the British with their Commonwealths, they come from everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, yeah, that, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not I'm not English, um, <laughs> so uh, none of us are. So, yeah, so those are models. And importantly, they didn't control for age, which, which you yeah. do need to do. Uh, and they, uh, what they're essentially doing here is they're testing the null hypothesis that this interaction term, so this, can you see my mouse, by the way? Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So this, this SNP by smoking interaction term is equal to zero. And essentially, if, if there is no interaction between the two, if they're completely independent, you expect this term to equal zero. So that's the null hypothesis that they're testing. And they tested about 330 SNPs. Um, so 82 of them had a nominal p-value of less than uh, 0.05, but there was no attempt to correct multiple comparisons uh, here. And then they bootstrapped this with uh, a few, I think it was a few thousand iterations. But then they used a normal base p-value. And again, we can talk about that later if people want, but essentially that, that's a slightly, for me, that, that's a bit of a red flag and it's probably not, not the most uh, appropriate way of doing it. Essentially what they're doing here is they're assuming that the p-values um, or well, they're assuming that these interaction terms conform to a normal distribution, which in a small sample, if you're bootstrapping anyway, you're saying it could be non-parametric. So actually mm -hmm. it's quite a big assumption to then use a normal distribution based p-value. Really what you should do is you should just take, you know, you should take your, um, your confidence intervals should be your, uh, just your quantile based confidence intervals and then p-values you can work out exactly. So this, this is a bit of a, an assumption here and something I disagree with. But then they, they did do some bias correction and they took forward the signal that um, uh, at a bias corrected confidence interval didn't include the null. So what do they find? So first is demographics, pretty good, pretty well matched between the cases and controls, um, as you would expect. Well, um, one of the things that I also yeah. wondered is whether they also were, because that's, that's something you can't deduct from this table, but whether they also stratified for the HLR DRB15 status between smokers and non-smokers. Yeah, I don't think they did in the analysis. I, I, I won't lie. I haven't read all the supplementary stuff, but I, I, I don't think they did. They certainly didn't. No, they never, me they never mention it. And it's also yeah. because, yeah, because obviously it's very logic that you see a difference here, but imagine that in, so it means that they only have like 80 smokers, 80 non-smokers. It's yeah. not inconceivable that there is a difference in HLR, DRB, you know, and this is the biggest risk, risk factor overall, so. Yeah, agreed. So generally, they are well matched. The MS cases are more female. There are more smokers, and relatively low proportions of primary progressive MS, more so in stage one than stage two. So, uh, what did they actually find? So they found that these H2 signals had a nominal evidence of association at p-value of less than 0.05. They chucked out seven of those after correcting for bias using bootstrapping. And essentially, all of these analyses, they did some stratified analyses where they work up the odds ratio separately in carriers of the minor anil and non-carriers. Um, they did haptotype-based tests where essentially, rather than testing one SNP at a time, they're testing multiple SNPs. So they found haplotypes, which are you know, like a run of SNPs that um, people have. And they did a case-only analysis in stage two. And essentially, all of these did broadly support the hypothesis that minor alleles in crinane 9 potentiate the effects of smoking. They make it worse. They make uh, the effects of smoking on MS more pronounced. And minor alleles of crinane 7 seem to protect uh, so it seems to inhibit the effects of smoking on their mass risk. And this is the kind of the, the key table. And really just what I wanted to point everyone to in terms of the stratified analyses, because this, this to me is the most easy to understand. So these are looking at the odds ratios for the effect of smoking on MS risk in carriers of the minor allele versus non-carriers of the minor allele for each of these 10 variants, which captured most of the variation at the, both low pi. So what you can see is that for CRNA9, the carriers of the minor allele, smoking had a more pronounced effect. So the odds ratio of smoking in this group is 2.4, whereas actually in the non-carriers, it doesn't seem to have much of an effect at all. All these uh, confidence intervals cross one. For chrono 7, it's the other way around, where mostly, with this exception of this one, this last snip here, 
mostly carriers of the minor allele, so people who have the rarer allele, the effect of smoking on MS risk is actually lower than people who have the major allele. And that's interesting. This is a quite notable exception that goes well in the other direction. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, I have quite a lot of things to say about this study uh, and I have some more slides, but I thought maybe this would be a good point to stop and have a bit of a chat. Um, I, I, I can also carry on talking and then we can chat at the end. I don't know what people I know think it's is good. best. But one of the things that I was missing in the methodology was also like a power analysis, because, you know, they only have 203 people people included they yeah. test for three uh, for 332 snips yeah. um you know what is there yeah obviously they find something significant but yeah it's i don't think that i think they should have made their results maybe a little bit more robust statistically but, yeah uh, I, I i agree I, I suppose the power is kind of and it's also not, not entirely nice to... is it there in the stable how rare these variants are but is the, do they have yeah, like a sort you... of minor ah, yeah yeah so yeah you put the mask in yeah so most of them are common, isn't it? Yeah, um, most of them are common. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I just missed the power right. calculation, you know, because I think they really, they don't have such a big cohort and it actually, in essentially it's only the stage one that is relevant because the stage two, then they only can test seven of the SNPs again. So it's mainly the stage one and there they do really a lot of statistical tests. Um, yeah, for... They can't, really, uh, they can't really use the stage two, can they, for uh, validation, can they? No, because it's only cases. Yes. So, so it's hard to get effect estimates in the same way. Um, so, I mean, does, does everyone understand the principle of using a case-only design? Do people kind of get that? Well, tell us about the case-only, Ben. So, so the idea is that if, if you have an interaction between a risk factor, so an environmental risk factor like smoking and mm -hmm. genetic risk factors, then um, among cases, so among cases but not controls, you will see the coincidence of those two more than in the controls. So mm -hmm. among cases, you will see that more people have the risk allele and smoke than have those two as their controls. Okay. Does, it, does that make sense? So the coincidence yeah. of those two risk factors should be higher. So essentially what you're doing in a case only design is you're exploiting that observation and you're essentially looking for an association between each, each of the variants that you're interested in and your environmental risk factors. So actually smoking is your outcome. And what you would expect is that if there is substantial interaction, then in the cases, you will see a relationship between the genetic variant of interest and the environmental exposure. So case-only designs are very powerful. They're actually more powerful, but they're more prone to bias um, if genetic variants and your, your risk factor aren't independent in the population. Mm -hmm. so, so they are very powerful. Um, the, you're right that the effect estimates, as I understand it, it, you can't straightforwardly match them up to the effect estimates from a case control design, uh, but, it, but it is a very powerful approach. I don't know if anyone else wants to say anything at this point, if I should show some more. So you could probably, Ben, knowing your data set, you could probably validate this. I'm, com uh, I'm coming to that again. Coming to that again. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, so uh, in terms of some good things, so uh, it's good that this recapitulates the divergent effects of alpha-7 and alpha-9. That's reassuring. That's biologically plausible. It's good that they try to replicate this in a kind of semi-independent cohort. I say semi-independent, it's not really independent. It's good they control for population structure because, as we were saying, even with a small data set that's relatively, even with a relatively homogenous data set, you can still get population stratification throwing off your results. It's good they try to use a case, a case only design, it's very powerful. In a way, it's good it's hypothesis driven, but we, we can come to that. And it's nice that they use some haplotype and some stratified analyses to support the initial conclusion. Mm -hmm. I, I think the stratified analyses in particular are a more intuitive way of representing this kind of study. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, so firstly, I, I don't really know what it means. So the kind of the data that seems to support the hypothesis, so the, the kind of the rationale for doing this was the effect of nicotine. But mm -hmm. the cigarette smoke has got loads of things in it and nicotine is only one of them. So for me, the more interesting way of testing the hypothesis, or the, the purer way is to do this with snooze use in, in Scandinavia and, and that data must exist. So that'd be very interesting, but to do it with a kind of purer nicotine based compound rather than cigarette smoke, which presumably has all kinds of things which do all kinds of things to your nicotinic receptors. How hypothesis driven really is it? So my suspicion with these things where you have, you know, you have genome-wide information available, 
my suspicion when people say they're doing a hypothesis study is always that they look genome wide, there was nothing significant, and then they post hoc went back and did some hypotheses. I'm, I'm not casting any aspersions here on this study, but you always have to ask yourself what what is the point in doing hypothesis driven designs when we have the data set and we have methodology available to do this genome wide. Um, mm -hmm. You, you just increase your risk of finding spurious false positives, in, in my opinion. It's not truly replicated in an independent cohort. So the point of replication is to do it in a complete separate cohort where mm. things, things are measured differently. There are different biases, different selection criteria. And this is just the same cohort divided up. The case only design, as I said, is biased if uh, G A and E aren't independent in the population. There's a very small number of cases for the discovery sample. There is no control for multiple testing. And for me, this is the real, this is the cardinal sin of the paper. Yeah, so um, the generalizability is probably quite limited to white Europeans. I mean, that's very normal for genetic studies, unfortunately. And the phenotype definition, as, we, as we've discussed, it's, it's ever never, it misses the quantity, mm -hmm. it misses packages. And as you say, either there are some discrepancies between stage one and stage two, and whether or not you should use a month or you should use a bit longer. So, so for me, the key things that need to happen is that this needs to be replicated. Uh, I, I personally think you should always be doing a genome-wide approach to these things. Uh, I, I don't think in 2020, where the data sets are available, we should be doing hypothesis-driven studies like this anymore on, on you know, where, where we can do uh, unbiased designs. Um, the functional impacts would be quite interesting to explore. So these are all intronic variants. They're not coding, so they can't, they don't directly affect protein structure or function of the receptors, but they probably affect something to do with the expression level or the way these are incorporated into the receptors, um, or they do something else complicated and regulatory. So it'd be interesting to explore that. And you can look at additive interaction as well, which is a, a topic for another day. So does anyone want to say anything about that? Well, I mean, I mean, I think you summed up the issues. The question then is, um, this is not going to pick up rare alleles, is it? Or rare variants? No, I mean, with this kind of sample size, you, you would be worried about doing anything with, with rare variants. Well, uh, elaborate, what, what are you? No, no, I'm just saying it's just, you know, um, but you, the, 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 um, I mean, that's where potentially the hypothesis can be tested if there were rare variants. Yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know if there are rare variants in these two, these two candidate genes. But anyway. <laughs> but also the rare variants would that because this is if it's a, an environmental effect at population level, they could probably never explain it. No. Yeah. I, it should I, be. A, it should be a relatively common variant. No, of rel like relatively common pathways that are involved. Otherwise, they could never confirm into this population-based risk. Yeah, exactly. But oh, I think, no. Gavin, you're, you're right that um, it would be interesting to try and do this in a population where you have a very high number of, of rare deleterious variants. So something like the East London Genes mm -hmm. and Health cohort, where, I mean, this information will become available in the next mm -hmm. few years. But that's interesting because that would be enriched for, you know, high, for low mass, but high effect size variants, which um, may affect you know, enzymes in this pathway. What, what's interesting about things like ns transferase is that it's very polymorphic. So there is a huge amount of common variation which substantially affects enzyme activity. And, that, and that's quite a rare situation. You know, this is the thing about slower settlators and faster settlators. So that there aren't many examples that I'm aware of where you have common variation which has such a substantial impact, impact on enzyme activity. So th those, for me, are the most interesting candidates to explore. If you're going to do a kind of candidate gene approach, um, then those are probably the way to go. So, okay, so yeah, so um, so uh, as Gavin uh, ju jumped the gun with, yeah, I, I, so I've had a look at UK Biobank. Essentially, UK Biobank, people probably know about. It's a very large um, cohort study based in the UK. They're tracking about 500,000 relatively healthy individuals recruited after the age of 40. Um, they're, all, they're all getting on now, I think, into the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s. So there, I, I did various exclusions. I won't bore you with the technical details, but essentially we, we repeated this in about 1,200 MS cases and most of the, um, the unmatched controls, these are the, are the unrelated white European controls. We extracted all the SNPs within 50 kilobytes, um, uh, sorry, 50 kilobase pairs of both of these genes. And, and we did the same kind of approach where we just modeled MS status on those SNPs. We controlled for age and sex. Um, 
in all, all my analyses, I've just been excluding people who diagnosed with MS prior to the age of 20. Uh, and we just looked at smoking prior to the age of 20. And actually, the majority of people in the data set who smoke later in life start before they're 20. Mm -hmm. um, and then we control for the first 10 genetic principal components, which captures almost all of the, the genome-wide variation due to ancestry. Uh, and then we include this interaction term as well. And essentially, again, you're just testing the interaction term to see whether that's equal to zero. And we found a few more SNPs. So the UK Biobank is, you know, is very densely imputed. It's a, a really amazing piece of work. Um, so the, this is all imputed to the uh, Haplotype Reference Consortium. So there are lots and lots of variants which are high quality. So we found about 400 SNPs in total, 250 in CRUN 7A and 160 in uh, CRUN 9A. And I, I, there are various ways of determining the number of independent tests that you have. One thing you can do is you can clump. So you can look to see how many LD blocks and mm -hmm. linkage disequilibrium blocks there are in your set of SNPs. Um, and, and I did this, I mean, it's slightly arbitrary what you choose as your threshold for what you call a clump. Um, but I think it's important to make some effort to determine how many independent tests there are. And then I controlled for that number of independent tests. And essentially there are no, there are no SNPs which, which surpass the significant threshold. J just to kind of show you the importance of replicating and the reason that it, it's dangerous to make claims based on a single data set. And so, so how, what was the percentage of smokers in this replication cohort? Oh, it's high. Uh, I can't remember the number. It's like, it's like 20, 10, 20%. It's very, it's very high. Okay. Um, oh, that's overall. Um, mm -hmm. I think, sorry, that's in the MS cases. I can't remember. I can I'll send you later. No, it's just to have an eye general uh, idea. Oh, uh, yeah. It, it's quite a few. I can't remember. In, in the whole data set, it's, like, it's quite a few thousand. It, it's pretty representative of a kind of reasonably mm -hmm. middle class um, Perry University town population. <laughs> um, so just to show you the dangers of making claims based on a single data set, this is a plot of the, um, the p-values. So on the x-axis is the p-values from the, the study we're talking about, and, and on the y-axis the p-values of the same SNPs. There weren't many that are overlapping, but the same SNPs in UK Biobank. And what you can see, these are minus log 10 p-values, is that these, these are much, much bigger. Um, these, these are much, much bigger. So there's a bit of sy systematic inflation of p-values um, in their data set. Mm -hmm. In addition, um, here are the kind of uh, Manhattan-style plots. So these are all of the SNPs that we found in UK Biobank at these two loci. So um, mm -hmm. I can't remember which way around it is. One of these is CRIN 7A, one of them is CRIN 9A. But essentially, if I tell you that, you know, GWAS significant um, threshold is um, 5 times 10 to the minus 8, these are mm -hmm. well, well below that. These mm -hmm. are well below that. And I, I'm not going to show you the genome-wide plots because I'm saving that for later. But mm -hmm. um, essentially, if, if you plot these on a genome-wide scale, these pale into insignificance, and that just emphasizes, the, to, to my mind, the, the relatively um, old-fashionedness of doing this kind of hypothesis-driven approach, because you have to understand these things in genomic context. And mm -hmm. if you look at two genes and you say they're significant, but then you look at the rest of the genome and there are loads of other effects which are much, much bigger, mm -hmm. uh, that, that's difficult to interpret. So I, I really can't find any evidence of an effect here in UK Biobank, which is a much bigger cohort. That's useful. So you got, are you going to, I hope this is in your letter to the MSJ. Ben. Yeah, yeah, we just put this in as a quick thing. I mean, it's always difficult. I think it's difficult to get the tone right, isn't it? Because I was worried you know, it sounds a bit um, snarky, but I, I don't mean to sound snarky. It's just no, I, but I, I think, think no, but I think you are entirely right because the thing is, we, it was the same. Do you know, like uh, three years ago, they found this um, rare variant that was um, linked with MS. I think somewhere yeah, in the, in. in United the inflammasome. Yeah, in the, in the inflammasome. And then also the, so, and then, so it was also done in a small cohort and then they replicate, so they tried to replicate it with the data from the IMSGC and they didn't find any effect at all. So I think it's really true that if, especially for like this complex genetics with frequent variants, you need big, big cohorts and it's the only way to be sure of your data. Yeah. Okay, so I'm actually learned a few things today, Ben. Thank you. I like this. Um, you know, when you're looking at um, within this, in, in, in just in the cases, which is uh, the interaction, because that's kind of getting to the causal pathway. So you're looking. So in other words, that's one of the problems with Mendelian randomization. You know, you're looking for the variants that predispose you to having the adverse event from the environmental exposure. But if you've got within your cohort people that have been exposed to the environmental exposure and those that haven't, that's kind of like an internal 
control. control provided there's no blood, there's no bias in the population but i assume there's always biases in the population um what i'm trying to say is people that smoke are not the same people that don't smoke yeah um yeah, have you tried, yeah. has that been, can you give me an example where smoking has been linked to something else? Via this kind of G by E approach. Yes, yeah. So, so the, the best example, I think, is, is NAP, is the NS transferase genes and, and bladder cancer. Okay, so, right. um, so I think it's the, it's the people who are slower acetylators essentially can't. They, um, are, I can't remember which way around it is. So one of them, I think it's the, the slower acetylators. Essentially, they, they accumulate much more of the muck, and they can't they can't clear it, and they're the ones who get bladder cancer. That's, and that's and, very, and okay. same with aniline dyes as well. It's the same thing. Okay, so look, guys, I've got to go to another meeting, so I'm going to leave you on in this one, and I'm going to log off on the other one. So that's why I've got it on two programs. All right, I will. Ben, that is that's really insightful. I'm going to now go through and send me your letter. I want to read it. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send it around the team. Write it from the uh, the Bart's MS team. No, no, it's very. I mean, I, I mean, um, okay. Well, I mean, I, I don't feel snarky because it's all about. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, having um, data sets that can reproduce something. That's what science is all about: is reproduction. If you can't reproduce something and you've got much better data set to show it. In reality, this individual should have had this hypothesis and contacted pers a person like you or contacted the Swedish group, to be honest with you, because you're right. You know, the best group to do this in is is the snuff users. Yeah, um, yeah I'd like to see that study. And, and the Swedish guys are doing, doing this all already, Ingrid Kockham and uh, Larsen. Well, they're not all Swedish. So, yeah, I mean, what you could do is just drop them an email and ask them if they can do the analysis for you. They can do it quickly. Yeah. yeah. yeah nice. Look after yourselves, guys. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah. Okay, see you later. What, is, what does everyone else think? What are we all? Um, it's only the three of us, no? I don't know. Um, and Ruth. Ruth. Ruth was there, I think. Yes. Oh, well, this was brilliant, Ben. I, I, I've, I've been trying to keep track of uh, uh, things, but uh, totally different discipline to me, but uh, a lot to learn from you. This is very good. Oh, I'm sorry, Todd. Thank you. Very generous. Thank you. No, it was really interesting. Good points. Okay, okay. but I think we we, st we are finished. I, I think uh, we've made all points. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's winding down a bit, isn't it? Yeah, um, so I think we can uh, leave the, the meeting now and then uh, we'll discuss uh, another time. Okay? Awesome. Yes, very well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nice to see you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.